Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone here in the United States, and good evening to those joining us from the United Arab Emirates. Thank you for joining us for a very special Smart Women, Smart Power event. I'm Beverly Kirk, Director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative and Fellow in the International Security Program here at CSIS. We are very pleased to welcome Her Excellency Sarah Alamiri, the UAE Minister of State for Advanced Technology and Chairperson of the UAE Space Agency for a conversation about the historic HOPE spacecraft mission to orbit Mars and international cooperation in space. Minister Alamiri is also the chairwoman of the Emirates Scientists Council, the chairwoman of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Council, the chairwoman of the Dubai Future Academy Board of Trustees. The World Economic Forum has honored her as one of its 50 young scientists for her contributions to science, technology, and engineering. Today's event is being held in conjunction with the CSIS Aerospace Security Project and the CSIS Middle East Program. The Smart Women, Smart Power Speaker Series is possible thanks to our founding partner, City. We are very grateful for City's continued support of this initiative. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Kristen Solheim, Director, Federal Government Affairs at City. You will be hearing her voice and seeing her photo just because of a bit of a technical problem. Kristen? Thanks so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Bev. And sorry, I'm not seeing you all in person, but um, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning for another Smart Women, Smart Power um, event for 2021. At City, we proudly call ourselves the leading global bank because we're present in nearly 100 countries, including the UAE. And we talk a lot about our distinct business advantage the global footprint offers us, but we also believe it provides a really unique perspective on the challenges and opportunities around the world. And this year is certainly no different. Um, city has been supporting this event series for six years, bringing together women leaders in foreign policy, national security, and the business community, community to talk about some of the most pressing issues our world is facing. And today we are thrilled to have a young and brilliant female scientist in our midst, uh, Minister Sarah Alamari will join us for the conversation, and I'm very ex excited to hear about her fascinating career. I know we all learned how to work remotely, and some of us have mastered the, the technology to be productive in 2020 and 2021, but Minister S Sarah Alamari took it a step further, and she and her team sent a spacecraft to Mars millions and millions of miles away here from from Earth. So she is a, an overachiever to be certain. I can't wait to hear more about that mission and her fascinating career. So I'll turn it over to Nita to Nina to get us started. Thanks. Great. And thank you, Kristen. And thank you to City. Uh, we so enormously value your support. Uh, we started this program nearly seven years ago to amplify the voices of women and in, in national security, to give inspiration to girls pursuing that kind of career. And uh, you've been right at our side the whole time. So thank you so much. And welcome your excellency. It's so great to have you here. It's really an honor. Um, and her excellency, I just wanna make everybody aware has asked me to call her Sarah. So that's what we will call you. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Nina. It's a pleasure being here, and this is an excellent platform um, that I've learned from in the past, and I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Great. Um, so, Sarah, I'm just going to dive in for the, to this past year, because before we get to what your career that led you here, it, this has been quite an enormous year for you to fill everybody in. Um, the UAE now has a spacecraft orbiting Mars. Uh, and when we were all hunkered down in the midst of COVID in July 2020, I believe July 15th to be exact, Sarah, um, Sarah was, I think, probably biting her nails, a little nervous, um, watching the uh, rocket ship that took uh, the spacecraft to Mars take off from an island in Japan. 
Sarah, tell us about that day. Where were you and what was going on inside your head and your and your heart? So it was a few days after July 15th on July 21st, and it was nerve wracking leading up to that. We were actually scheduled, like you said, rightly, Nina, to, to, to take off on the 15th. And the weather was not cooperating at all um, at that time. Uh, at that moment, what went through my head is seven years of uh, working on this program from the initial thought of going to Mars to having a spacecraft on top of a rocket awaiting launch uh, to head to another planet is just it's very hard to describe just the feelings that it goes into this. It's very hard to describe what it is. It's pretty much a large chunk of your life flashing in front of your eye um, and work that you've you've put your heart and soul in every hour in uh, to get to where it is today, resting on top of a rocket, awaiting um, a very powerful launch to get out of Earth's gravity and to head to another planet. Um, it was a very surreal experience. Uh, it was nerve wracking at times. Uh, there was a lot of apprehension. There was a lot of excitement. Um, and it was, um, as me and the team call it, it was a, a roller coaster ride that had amazing highs and then um, points where you hold your breath and just hope for the best, um, knowing that you've done everything in your power to get to where you are today. And were you in, at that island in Japan, or were you, um, or you were you watching this remotely? So I was, uh, I, I was at the island in Japan. A small team of us managed to um, get to Japan um, to meet the team that was there for about four months preparing the spacecraft, living in relative quarantine um, um, during that time in the pandemic. But um, I was really glad I was there. Uh, a bit of sadness that I wasn't with the whole team. You usually experience launches with your whole team that was part of the journey moving forward, but it was it was just an amazing experience to to live through it. So after it took off, how long could you see it with the naked eye, and how long, I assume, with a with telescope uh, technology, you could watch it? So we did rely on the naked eye. It was about for a few minutes, uh, about five minutes during that time um, that we were seeing the spacecraft. We were glad that the day was crystal clear, that we were even able to detect with the naked eye the separation of the first stage, which is the first sort of sigh of relief um, th that we got there. And then um, after that, and I think with the wonders of COVID, we were able to remotely access the, the screen that shows the health and safety of the spacecraft while we were there um, at the um, um, at the launch site uh, to, to just watch and see if there's any vital signs from the spacecraft, that the spacecraft deployed its solar panels, that it's alive and working and functioning and heading towards its destination. So the next big, the biggest moment for you was came in February, I believe, when you had those, uh, as you've described it, I think, nail biting moments about whether it would go into orbit around Mars. Take us up to that. Were there any moments before that where it, it was a little touch and go or any concerns getting there? And then tell us about that moment. So our, our journey was relatively uneventful and just sending something that's completely new by uneventful. Yes, we had a few glitches here and there and hiccups here and there, but nothing that is not expected, which is good, which is what you want uh, when you're heading to another planet before you enter into orbit around that planet. Um, this is a heavily refer rehearsed sequence. We've been rehearsing getting to Mars. We've tested it on the spacecraft on the ground. We tested it while the spacecraft is in the path. We have a replica of the spacecraft on a table that we also test that sequence. So this was a heavily re rehearsed sequence. So you have a part of you that is confident that you as a team with a collective power of people with years of experience uh, that have done things right and have done things wrong and learned from it um, behind you. So you have that confidence that you've done everything in your power, but at the same time, uh, the success of this minute, mission rests on a 30 minute burn of most of the fuel that you flew on this spacecraft. And it's the worst position that the spacecraft could possibly be in to get into orbit around Mars. So it's that continuous sort of balance between, yes, we did everything in our power, but 
we can't control the outcome beyond this point. We had no real time communication uh, with the spacecraft because of distance between um, Earth and Mars. And therefore, any glitch of any sort, the spacecraft needed to react on its own. Um, and I think that's what factored into a lot of that apprehension uh, during that time. And I think a teachable moment for all of us was you can do everything in your power and understanding and you can mitigate risks and you can be the best designers out there and have the best team out there, but you can never guarantee success in certain in, in these situations. And it was an amazing learning opportunity for me. It was an amazing learning opportunity for a lot of my colleagues who then became friends uh, on the back of this mission. So it's, I, I always call um, such missions and such um, planetary exploration missions due to their complexity, a human building journey and a personality developing journey more on top of all the technical aspects that go into it. How so? How is it a personality building journey? It's um, like I said, there's a lot of unknowns um, that you're operating with just by the nature of the business. Uh, you need to live with a lot of risk. We we went into this very early on, knowing that only half of missions succeeded. You're building a spacecraft for the very first time. So what we have today around orbit, we've never sent another one out there. We don't understand its performance apart from what we've studied here on the ground. So as much as you turn a lot of the unknowns into knowns, the space of the unknowns is quite large. And um, doing that on, again, an international, so sending the spacecraft to Mars, you're doing it on an international venue, you're doing it in front of the world, um, and it's just an immense learning opportunity and an immense learning journey uh, that goes into it. So it was, for me personally, it was a technical endeavor, um, and again, it was a character building um, endeavor moving forward throughout the last seven years. And it was also quite a feat for the second largest economy in the Middle East, the UAE. Um, but it was also an international effort. So could you talk about some of the other partners behind it from the Japanese rocket ship to University of Colorado Boulder's role? Absolutely. So doing this for the first time, you need to rely on experience and expertise so that you're able to maximize scientific return. We had an objective of gaining more experience in design and development of complex technology systems. We've never married scientific objectives with technological development in one program. So these are all aspects that we require as an economy that's gr growing and flourishing and as an economy that 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 is infusing technology as one of the pillars of development moving forward. To be able to do that, the only way you do it is like everywhere in the world, just to work with people with experience um, um, and develop those capabilities. We didn't have the experience um, as a country on, on building planetary exploration missions. We had experience uh, prior to this mission working on designing satellites uh, that go to Earth. Again, factor of complexity is roughly five times more complex than any of the other programs that I've worked on before. And therefore, partnering up with the University of Colorado Laboratory of Atmospheric Space Physics with a group of amazing researchers and engineers and scientists who've done this before, who've made the mistakes and know where, where to avoid them and had these successes moving forward. And we just amalgamated an entire team across two institutions. We operated as the Emirates Mars Mission Team, um, as the HOPE uh, Mars Mission Team, and worked hand in hand on designing and developing the spacecraft um, to the state that it's in uh, at the moment. And on top of that, again, it made a lot of sense to, to make sure that we use a launch vehicle that is reliable um, and that can get us to our necessary orbit without incurring additional burdens on the program. And therefore, after a selection process, we went with our Japanese partner and, and selected the launch vehicle out of Mitsubishi Heavy um, Industries. And that's not only the that's like the top layer of any um international collaboration in space like you know there's a lot of components that go into space systems and across the world you utilize companies from everywhere um to be able to source a lot of these components uh, that go into your spacecraft and it's just it, I love working in the space sector because of its internationality and because of the diversity in thinking from a technical perspective that flows into any mission design and development. And um, that has immensely impacted the success of this mission 
um, and allowed us to think of a new approach of designing and developing. Like, you know, it took us less time to develop such a mission at a much lower cost and price point. And just getting those different perspectives of design and development experiences, um, risk appetites together um, allowed us to redesign the process by which you design such a spacecraft and the process by which you select your question, scientific questions and the mechanism by which you go about managing such a program um, and allowed us to, to, to meet our tight deadline and allowed us to meet uh, what we've been told very early on the mission is that you're not getting an additional budget um, and there's no way out of this. And it's just, um, and I'm really glad for it. I think those constraints were a bit of an annoyance early on, but I'm really glad those constraints were imposed on the project team in terms of the timeline, in terms of the cost, because it allowed us to innovate in ways that we wouldn't have, uh, because you sometimes take time for granted and you sometimes take uh, budget for granted. And you didn't have time because you were, this is part of the Jubilee ce celebration. Talk about that. And why did you name this, this uh, orbiter HOPE? It is part of the Jubilee's um, um, celebration. It is a mark of transition for the country. Like I said, um, we are tra continuing to transition as an economy. We completely understand the role that science and technology across the spectrum, the role that research and development plays, the, the role that technological advancement in industries today and the deployment of technologies in industries today can play in further sustaining our economy and ensuring that we continue the growth pat pattern uh, and continue the stability uh, that we have within the country from both an economic perspective and also from a social perspective. Um, and that, that um, drove us towards having such a mission and drove uh, 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 drove the the um, team within the UAE to have such a mission as one of the cornerstones and one of the pillars by which today we are seeing scientific findings and it's a completely no new experience when you're handling data for the very first time um, and and finding artifacts that is not written in books. We've never experienced that before. Um, and it's just such a mind, I think, shifting moment to be able to experience that full circle and understand the magnitude of what scientific discovery really is. Yeah, so and we'll go back a little bit later and talk about that rise of the knowledge economy and the role of women and, and girls in that as well. But let's go back to the HOPE mission. Um, again, the, the name HOPE. Yeah. Why? So um, if we go back to when this this program was conceptualized in late 2013, um, the region was coming on the back of a lot of instability and a lot of it was due to the youth not having a voice, not having opportunities and not having basis, basic access to stability uh, within the region and access to opportunity. And for us, it was a putting together for the UAE's government and prime minister was putting together a program that one empowers youth that make up a large portion of this region and empowers them on a very risky program. Um, at the time that we started this mission, I think we were all 30 and under um, the project team. <laughs> um, average age, I think today is 27, 28. We've aged a bit. Um, and it's it, it, it was it was quite a market sort of mark of hope that yes, entrust the youth, yes, provide them with opportunities, provide them with the tools and see how they rise by using science and technology as a mechanism to infuse development. And that was the reason behind the selection of the name. That's very powerful. And and what percent of those engineers are women? At th what was it, 30 percent? 34 percent are women. And and uh, what's remarkable for me is that the science team that um, I used to lead during the development uh, started off as 100% women and as a drive d diversity push, uh, we managed to get 80% women um, into the team. So it, everyone was there. We, we never went into this. Uh, as, you, as you know, we rushed into this program. We never went into this with a sort of sort of let's check the box and make sure we have uh, enough women in this. It was more of an approach of um, finding the right people um, at, in the right job and it's not surprising from that context because we continue, at least over the course of the last 15 years, there's been such a large rise in the number of uh, STEM graduates who are women. 
um, out of universities in the Emirates and all, also out of students that are studying abroad from the Emirates. Um, and we continue seeing that rise, um, which is good until you reach gender parity, but we continue to observe those numbers to ensure that we have gender parity because diversity in science is always important. You never want to skew one way or another. Tell us why, why is it important? Different, it goes back to what I spoke about earlier. Science thrives on asking questions and asking questions. The basis of that is differences in perspectives, differences in experiences, differences in, in the way that you think. And that's why diversity plays such an important role in pushing science forward and push, pushing exploration forward, that we need to be conscious um, of ensuring that there's diversity in teams. And I've seen that across teams where there weren't, and I'm talking about diversity not only in terms of gender, I'm talking about diversity across the board. Um, and I've seen that in teams that have worked that that don't have a lot of di diversity versus diversity. And you see teams that have such a nice sort of amalgamation of perspectives be quite innovative um, and quite understanding of, uh, um, and it's quite a different environment to work in. I love hearing that from you, Sarah, because a lot of companies today talk about that, you know, diversity drives innovation. Um, but to hear that on the ground, and I love that, um, as you put it, it's it's about questioning. It's about the, the root of innovation is questions, right? And you get better questions if you have diverse perspectives. I think that's incredibly profound and fundamental. Exactly, Nina. You, you wouldn't be able to advance um, w without that. And I think all of us as leaders, as team members, need to ensure that our, whatever it is, um, and, and I do that across my teams, not only uh, um, on, on developing a mission to Mars, is to ensure that there is always a voice heard and there's always differences in perspectives, because that's the only way that you, one, see blind spots and avoid having a lot of blind spots. And like you said, that's the only way you can innovate. Um, and. Now, hope is obviously still going around um, or, or in orbit. And um, tell us about, I love the, um, the mission of hope, uh, which has some relevance to Earth and our climate issues. What is the fundamental mission? What's the scientific question that you're looking to address? So we're looking at three different science questions um, on Mars. First, we are observing the weather system in Mars throughout an entire Martian year during all times of the day. So that's a gap of knowledge that we're, we're filling in because prior to this mission, we were able to observe um, Mars's weather, but during only two times of the day. And like we know, it's not comprehensive to study any planet's weather system during two times of the day. Um, so we're getting that full understanding of the weather system on the entire planet. Two Earth years is equivalent to one Martian year, and therefore we're able to cover all the seasons during all times of the day. We also look at loss of hydrogen and oxygen from the upper atmosphere loss. That, that of course, is historically one of the reasons that we that is theorized that we don't have liquid water on the surface um, of Mars, and escape is one of the um, one of the factors uh, that has played a part in in the transformation of uh, Mars. Uh, from a wet planet to the planet that we see today. Um, and the third question that we're trying to do is, we are understanding changes that are happening. So cloud systems formations, dust storms that are happening in the lower atmosphere, the weather system in Mars. And if any changes happens in the lower atmosphere, how does it impact loss of hydrogen and oxygen? And that will allow us to better understand a gap in the knowledge of what role did Mars play in the loss of its atmosphere and the escape of hydrogen and oxygen. So we continue today to observe the planet during all times of the day. It takes us about 10 days to cover the whole planet at all times. Um, and as we're moving forward today, the team is uh, processing a lot of the data that has been captured during the start of the science phase of the mission. The purpose that we're, we're going full steam ahead and processing this data is we want to release at least two to three months worth of uh, data sets uh, at the beginning of October so scientists around the world can benefit from it. And then from there, our science team will start anal analyzing that initial batch of scientific data to see what they've found. So I was joking with you before we started. It's it's probably that loss of oxygen and hydrogen is not from aliens driving fossil fuel vehicles. But that said, you, I assume you see some relevance to what's going on in the Earth's atmosphere that this might conceivably be helpful in understanding. 
from a macro perspective, studying planets that are like Earth, that have atmospheres like Earth, that sort of looked like our planets. And Mars is the closest object that we can go to or send a spacecraft to and study extensively uh, that quote unquote resembles Earth. That allows us to have sort of a macro lens on what happens to planets, what happens to their evolution, what could happen to our planet. So it gives us better understanding and it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where the correlation is, because if I talk about the Emirates-Mars mission and a lot of the other spacecrafts that are currently around Mars, the kind of science that they're doing is novel science. And what that means is that we have theories, but we've never captured inten extensive real data sets to be able to va validate and verify our theories. And that's why it's very hard to find a correlation. And I think that's the beauty of space exploration. You don't really know what you're going to find out. And speaking of which, we were talking about, so you're going to be getting some um, some public, you're going to publicly release some of your findings in early October, but you you hinted that you have found some something, and hopefully you can talk about that here, that you didn't expect. So one of our instruments uh, can capture images in the ultraviolet. And uh, Mars, as we know, doesn't have a magnetic field like Earth. It has small pockets of like magnetic material that creates a form of a magnetic field. And that allows for auroras to form. And the auroras cannot be seen by the naked eye, but they can be seen using an ultraviolet spectrometer that we have flown on, on our spacecraft. And um, so we have... Uh, some scientists on our science team that have done that kind of research is not 100% correlated to the three science questions that I spoke about. But we were able to observe using our instruments those discrete auroras. Uh, um, and today, just with our current observations, we're able to capture data and characterize a form of auroras on another planet that will give us better uh, scientific uh, understanding on their formations um, and how they evolve throughout the night cycle um, on Mars. And um, it's it's quite impactful for science. And for us, it's nice, surprising science to get um, on the back. For us, it's um, bonus science, as I told you, on top of what we are uh, going there to discover. So uh, are there amazing photos we're going to be able to see, amazing imagery? Absolutely. So we've had very nice images uh, taken so far um, of Mars that could be seen. Um, some of those will be attached also to the scientific findings to better explain it. For me, the most beautiful image was the very first image that was captured um, about Mars. And it was quite beautiful because, so I spoke to you about, for example, the um, the cloud systems on Mars uh, and how they form over different locations and why it's important to study it at, at different parts of Mars. And luckily enough, we were able to observe a lot of the things that we talk about conceptually that you can only see using an infrared uh, wavelength or ultraviolet. You saw it there on that very first image. So that um, for me was uh, sort of a visualization of what we've been talking about for so many years um, and um, provide a very nice indication on what the science is going to be like. That's very exciting. Um, could you just give us some context? There's other uh, other vehicles have orbited or are orbiting um, Mars. What's going on? What countries are doing what? So there's several countries that have spacecrafts that are alive, either on the surface of Mars or orbiting the planet. And like Earth, uh, we continue to study Earth and we're here and we continue discovering new things. Uh, there's a lot to study about Mars. And for us, um, so we, there's an Indian mission there. There's a, a several missions from the United States there. There is a Chinese orbiter and um, and a uh, lander and a rover that's currently on the surface. Uh, and that and, and there, there are also um, European spacecrafts that are orbiting the planet that those extensive sort of data sets are complementary and we ensured that our that our mission is complementary to other missions but fills in a gap of scientific knowledge and by sharing this data and, and other countries around the world as well share this data and we pushed really hard to ensure that there's no embargo on our data so our scientists um, don't get a lot of time to analyze the data other than processing it for, for use before we put it out to the public um, and so it's, it's raw data and and there's an advantage to that it's raw data. It has levels of processing that scientists can grab off of our our website in October and start doing their own analysis while our team is doing their analysis as well in parallel. That maximizes scientific output because you, you collect a lot of data and you look at what's interesting to you. 
in those data sets. And like, like we saw with the auroras, you'll always get bonus artifacts that are captured together what you, with what you're looking at. It's like when you're looking at a, um, at a telescope, you'll, you'll see what you want to see. For example, if you're looking at a launch, but you'll able, be able to see other things um, together with it. So you're maximizing the utilization of scientific data. And I think it's very important when you invest a lot in scientific experiments, sending them like, like collecting and collecting data out of science, scientific experiments. I think it's very important to share those data sets because there's only so much you can do and extract from uh, that is based on your own objectives and your own hypothesis. But there's a lot of scientists uh, around the world that can all also extract valuable um, information out of the, those data sets and, and benefits. So the more people th that are working on data sets, I think this is this echoes across all sectors. This is not a space uh, sector aspect. Sure, it's wonderful to hear. Um, let's talk about your journey, uh, if we could. You talked in the past, you've talked about looking up at the sky when you were 12 years old. What did you see and what inspired you? So, the I always speak about the va I enjoy the vastness of space, if that makes any sense, and the boundlessness of space. So, it was always a philosophical journey that, um, and a philosophical thought journey of, of the significance of space. And I was really interested in understanding what are the galaxies, how many stars are there, planets, and just imagining sort of the plethora of, uh, um, of worlds uh, that are out there and that are quite starkly different than where we live in. And um, that has been a fascination um, all along for me with space, but it's always an area that I never dared to work on. We didn't have a space program at the time. That was sometimes sometime in the early 90s, I believe. We didn't, um, did we have, I don't think we had a satellite even in, in, in space um, at that time. Uh, so it wasn't something that you would go like, yeah, I want to be an engineer that works on a space program. Um, and lo and behold, um, I, I was fascinated by engineering. I loved the world of computers and how computers were built and wanted to design my own computer and therefore set my sights on computer engineering, the next best thing after space. And tell us about, yeah, the next best thing. Um, tell us about your studies uh, in computer engineering your degrees and where you studied. So I studied at the American University in Sharjah um, back home, um, computer engineering with both my undergraduate and then a few years into working uh, part time. I fi finished also my graduate degree in the same uh, program. Um, upon graduation, I fell on the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center completely by accident by answering some random ads on we're looking for computer engineers if you'd like to apply. Um, I believe it was the first place that I applied to after graduating. Um, I went in there, interviewed. They were finalizing the very first satellite that was launched by Sat1. I was grateful to be part of uh, that program and then and the subsequent programs moving forward. So uh, I started my journey there working as a software engineer. Um, and uh, it was just, I, I love how serendipitous that was, how things like fell I into place. Uh, and it was an interesting journey. And you, um, and at the time, that was that wasn't that the beginning of the space program for the UAE celebration of its fiftieth anniversary. So the the long term aspect of that was to develop capabilities of uh, engineers. So we were all hired as fresh graduates. Uh, we worked on design and development um, of various aspects of the spacecraft or, or the ground system. Uh, the institute, the the center was established in 2006. I joined it in 2009, um, prior to the launch of the very first satellite. Um, and we continued on on our Earth observation, design and development spacecrafts. And then, the Mars mission was a large leap for us um, in terms of of capabilities um, and in terms of sort of pushing the bounds forward. And it was really interesting that decision, the way that it was made. Uh, it was actually a request that we got for, from our uh, prime minister of moving from Earth observation to uh, planetary exploration. I think at that point, I didn't really understand why, but today um, it is it is what you call a shock to the system, uh, by which it was a turning point for us within the organization with which you can either amplify uh, the speed of development and amplify the output of development, or you can stagnate. 
um, as an organization. So that was an interesting sort of influx and an interesting point in retrospect. Uh, that is that is a very important learning uh, for myself um, in understanding. How about you I mean, what was your reaction to it? Like, this is crazy, or uh, did you, uh, or or uh, this is something I want to be on board. No, I, I, my, my uh, so the first two people working on this are myself and our project manager, Omran um, Sharaf. And I think the first day that we were asked about this was the day of the launch of our second satellite, Dubai Sat 2. Um, and weirdly enough, and we both always talk about this, we didn't think it was crazy for some reason. It was just, okay, so you want a feasibility study on whether or not we can go to Mars? Okay, let's, let's look into this and see how we can do it and what is the design approach and um what are the aspects that could be developed what capabilities do we have what capabilities do we need to pull in who are the partners that are potentially out there and so on so that that was the the mechanism that we usually worked on um which i think was very good in the spirit within the team uh to to take on something that may sound crazy in retrospect uh and be able to sort of structure it into a program um and you have two children. I think you said your little boy is a Star Wars fan. <laughs> My little boy enjoys uh, Star Wars. He's now thoroughly into Avengers mm-hmm. and the different wor- worlds. And he speaks to me about shifting universes and uh, <laughs> getting to planets. So it's, it's quite an interesting uh, journey that I've seen my children go through. Um, and the language that they've, they've spoken about, they've lived through this mission. Uh, my son, I think, was three or four when I first started working on on this program in particular. Um, And I see this in the children of those that have worked on this program on how it's impacted them. And what's what's really good about this is I've seen this in the children of people that are not working on this program within within the Emirates. So you see a large impact in language, in what is possible, and it's no, it's it's okay if somebody comes up and says, "I want to be a, an a, um, an astrophysicist," as an example. That was something. That you see, have, has the country seen movement in the numbers of young people studying just anything from STEM to astrophysics? Yes, there has been a large drive in STEM, and we've always, by the nature of the businesses and the sectors that we have in the country, we've always had large number of engineers graduating, graduating, but I've seen a large increase in the number of people graduating from natural sciences, which is very important for the sustainability of any knowledge-based economy. Um, and today I was sitting with an intern who was working with us working on astrophysics um, even this year for people completing their graduate studies a lot of them have submitted for scholarships to again study astrophysics that that was an area that i never imagined people would get a degree in let alone a graduate degree in so obviously you're seeing a lot of women do that um you know do you see even if there's opportunity there we often see in the United States, um, women, um, there's sort of an inner restraint um, that a lot of women have about pursuing uh, this, whether it's culturally or otherwise, or uh, what are you seeing among the women around you? And what advice would you give to women who don't think that this is something they should pursue or can pursue or, well, you know? So the two examples I just gave you were both uh, women. So I, I am seeing a large influx in, in um, women, especially participating or moving forward with a um, graduate degree um, in an area of science and natural sciences. Um, and it's my perspective on the whole sort of aspect of um, um, whether or not you can do something. It's a personal sort of inner choice if that makes any sense if you want to listen to to biases or if you want to completely ignore that those biases exist and 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 push forward yes challenges may exist along the way one challenges pertaining to the to the to the field uh, itself and then two perhaps even challenges with people that have inherent biases around you Uh, but if you sort of deafen yourself to, to those i think it's easy to push forward not easy, but it's it's easy internally to get the strength to to push forward and circumvent those. At the end of the day, anywhere it's out it's output. What's important is impact. What's important um, and how to move forward with it, rather than 
uh, hindering and putting blocks uh, from moving forward. And what's your, I, I guess, what's your inner conversation with yourself when you're facing a huge opt- obstacle, like, for example, going to Mars? Um, it depends on the day, uh, to be honest. Um, um, it's uh, p- keeping your eye on what the overall objective is and what you want to get to and why it's important in the larger context of things. So for me, that's what's important. At the end of the day, um, I believe that I'm part of society and therefore it's my mission to contribute to society in any way possible using the maximum amount of my own skills to the maximum of my ability. And that's what I hold myself accountable to in any role that I perform. And it's always that sort of taking a step back and understanding, okay, why is this challenge important to circumvent in the larger larger scale of this? How does it um, answer to my own values, to my own purpose um, in life, to my own role uh, within society as a whole? Um, so that's one conversation. Another one is usually external. So it's not always your own inner voice that you drive strength in. It's the people that you surround yourself with, because you can sometimes be blind uh, to whether or not you're driving yourself hard enough. Um, and I, I'm, I have a group of people um, around me that are brutally honest and to the point and will call me out. Um, and, and that for me has been a is a valuable part, uh, and I'm and I would do the same to them, and that's a valuable um, part of my life to ensure that it's not only an inner conversation because you can you can go as cute personally, uh, but it's always it's both an internal one and also an external one to ensure that you're continuously driving forward. So it's it's the inter it's um people who who call you out when you're resisting moving forward. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and and people who call you out when you, when you don't challenge yourself enough and tell you no, um, you, you can sort of convent this challenge. Why are you giving up on it? And and that has been. I'm quite grateful to having these people in my life because, for me, there has been moments where, which is normal, where it's just gotten really hard. It's, even on this mission, it, there were points where it's gotten really hard. There were uh, challenges that we were faced with where. You took a breath on what did we get ourselves into? And it's 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 really important to have that. Um, I don't want to call it a support system, but more of a driving system mm-hmm. uh, to ensure that you're con- that, that you're continuously delivering on what you're committed to, especially if it's something that is important to you. So as we um, sort of move up on uh, running out of time, I did want to spend some time on the future. So. You've got, tell us about um, where hope goes for here, from here. I think there's talk of a spacecraft, landing a spacecraft on Mars, and there's also talk of a lunar mission. Um, could you describe what's, what's coming up? So we are looking at the larger perspective of things with regards to the space sector. And I'll take you a step from away, perhaps, from space exploration into the space sector itself and why that sector is important for us in the country. The space sector does have both a social implication, as we've seen from the Emirates Mars mission. It has a scientific driver um, uh, uh, implication with which it feeds into academia and it feeds into driving a lot of people into STEM and, and creates a lot of opportunities. There's a third lever that's very important where it also drives economic benefit. Um, taking all these three different aspects together is is our mission today at the Space Agency, and that's marrying exploration missions together with uh, commercially viable data sets and products and services into developing smaller satellites that have commercial value and are able to prov- provide us with data that feeds into different sectors and creates a ne- necessary ripple effect. That's the focus area that we're currently working on uh, today. The The lever by which the the um, exploration missions will play into is develop- continuously developing capabilities. Like I said, an interesting lesson learned is that sort of trigger ignition. Exploration is that ignition that you give towards um, um, your economic diversification and the the um, sort of simulation of your um, space economy 
and the private sector within the space sector. And then everything else then is able to indirectly feed off of that and be able to create those necessary challenges. So that's the approach that we're taking. And as we continue to design not only the commercial missions, the commercial opportunities for the private sector, and also what are the right exploration missions to, to be able to serve those purposes. And each mission will serve a different purpose. And what I love about it, all of them further scientific discovery, um, regardless of what uh, purpose it serves for us here on Earth in terms of uh, development. Great. Um, and I have to ask you, we've had uh, a number of astronaut, women astronauts on our um, at Smart Women, Smart Power. Do you envision yourself going into space someday? Is it hard to be down on the ground when, you know, others are out there? Uh, for some reason, I, I don't. I did at a point in my life, but um, at the moment, no, I, I enjoy the area of the space sector that I'm working on. I don't think I'm cut out to be a... Uh, an astronaut or perhaps have the necessary passion or drive to be one. Uh, there are great women and men around the world and here in the Emirates that are pursuing those careers. But for me, it's it's I, I have quite a passion in, in, in bringing together those different policies that drive um, a lot of transformations in the country. I think I found the sweet spot in STEM that I love working in. It's great. Knowing yourself probably is an important confidence builder, too, and it sounds like you really know yourself. And Sarah, just final words on where you see exploration of deep space um, playing into Earth's future and the future of us. Um, as we continue as human beings to be inquisitive, um, space exploration will always be something that we endeavor to do. Um, and it's something that is quite important for us to understand our own planet, as it is studying anything here on Earth. Um, exploration will continue to be on the agenda globally uh, for, for governments and also for private sectors that are using it as mechanisms by which they stimulate development and push development forward. Um, it's something that we will continue to be committed to as humanity because of our inquisitive nature, but also because of the benefits that we've seen from exploration that are the amazing unknowns that we discover. Sarah, we wish you so well in your uh, in your HOPE project. I think it's so aptly named. Thank you so much for sharing your story and the story of the HOPE project with us. Um, we'll be watching you, especially starting in October. Thank you, Nina, and thank you so much for hosting me. It's been an amazing conversation with you today. Thank you, Your Excellency. And thank you to everybody watching us. Please join us for our next Smart Women, Smart Power event. And don't forget our podcast, Smart Women, Smart Power. Uh, you can find at, uh, at the CSIS website and beyond. So thank you so much for all to all of you for joining us.